there are several ways for describing the relationship between the input and the output of a system. Now, a difference equation is the discrete time version of a differential equation. And as far as relating the input of a system to its output, it's ideally suited to computation. So I've written a difference equation in a general form here, and we have that y being the output of the system plus a weight a1 times a pass value of the output plus another weight a2 times two pass values of the output. Finally, n steps back times a sub n has to be equal to b0 times the present value of the input plus b1 times the past value of the input and so on on through b sub m times a value of the input m steps back. We can write this in general form as a sum from k equals 0 to n of a sub k y of n minus k has to be equal to the sum k equals 0 to m bk x of n minus k and it's conventional to assume that a0 is equal to 1. And this is an nth order difference equation describing this particular system. What's really useful about this is that a total of n plus m plus 1 parameters, that is the ak's and the bk's, those completely define the relationship between the input and the output of this system. So it's a very efficient representation. Typically n and m are going to be relatively small for most systems that we're interested in. And by relatively small I'm meaning somewhere in the say 4 to 12 range. Now as for computation we can rearrange the difference equation to put the present output on the left hand side and then the function of past outputs on the right hand side as well as the input and this gives us a way of computing the present value of the system output from past outputs and the present and past inputs. So we've just taken basically these terms here and we've moved those to the other side of the equation and that way we've isolated y of n. So here's an example of a simple difference equation and it says that y of n minus one half y of n minus one is equal to one fourth x of n plus one fourth x of n minus one. And we can rearrange this to enable this to be computed by writing y of n is equal to one half y of n minus one plus one fourth x of n plus one fourth x of n minus one. So all we did was we moved this one half y of n minus one term to the other side of the equation. And if we start with n equals zero, then we can write that y of zero is equal to one half y of minus one plus one fourth x of zero plus one fourth x of minus one. And we can iterate this process. So now that we've computed y of zero, we can compute y of one as y of one being one half y of zero plus one fourth x of one plus one fourth x of zero. And given y of one, we can compute y of two as one half y of one plus one fourth x of two plus one fourth x of one, and so on. And this particular iterative relationship is actually implemented by the MATLAB command filter, which uses the coefficients of in front of the y's, we called those a k's in the previous slide, and the coefficients in front of the x's, we called b's and the input and it'll do this kind of recursive computation for you. You can also do it by hand. It's easy enough to see how this works. Suppose we have an input x of n which is 0 prior to time 0 and then it's 1 for n greater than or equal to 0. And we'll assume that initially our initial condition y of minus 1 is 0. And this is 0 initial conditions correspond to a system that is at rest. Okay, that has no stored energy in it. If we had a non-zero initial condition, then that would be leftover energy from some previous action that took place with the system. So if we start with the system at rest, and we assume we have this input, which changes from zero to one at time zero. We can write y of zero as one half zero plus one fourth times one plus one fourth times zero, which is one fourth. Then use this value, y of zero, and that's going to go in here and we'll have y of 1 is 1 half times 1 fourth plus 1 fourth times 1 plus 1 fourth times 1 and that gives us 5 eighths and here to get y of 2 I'm going to take 1 half times y of 1 which is 5 eighths and add that up and I get 13 sixteenths 
and so on. So it's very straightforward to actually compute the numerical values of the output using this difference equation. Now next we're going to look at four different examples of difference equations. In this first example, we've got a six-point average. So the output is simply given by an average of the six most recent inputs. And if you think about what this system is going to do, what kind of characteristic it's going to impart to the input, by averaging, we're smoothing out fluctuations. So this is going to attempt to amplify the lower frequency components in X and attenuate high frequency components in X. Because things that change over this interval are going to get averaged out. A second system we'll look at is a six point difference. In this case, we're going to take the output as the difference of successive values. So I have x of n minus x of n minus 1 plus x of n minus 2 minus x of n minus 3 plus x of n minus 4 minus x of n minus 5. And we'll take one-sixth of this difference. So in this case, if something is constant over a six-point interval, it's going to get zeroed out. Because when I take these successive differences, I'll keep getting zero. On the other hand, if something is changing sign every other sample, that's going to get averaged and reinforced. So this is going to tend to attenuate low frequency type inputs and accentuate high frequency type inputs. Now neither of these two systems has any recursion. And by recursion, I'm referring to the fact that the present value of y depends on past values of y. This third system we'll call a recursive low pass system and it says that y at time n is 0.95 times the previous value of y plus 0.05 times x of n. And it's not easy to see intuitively by looking at this equation as to the characteristic that this system imparts, but it's going to tend to emphasize low frequency terms and cancel out high frequency terms. Then our fourth example is a recursive high pass system. And this particular system is very similar to the low pass except for a sign change on the coefficient being applied to y of n minus 1. Terms that are constant tend to get attenuated with this particular system. And again, it's not very easy to see that from this equation on its own. We have other ways of drawing that inference that relies on different types of descriptions for the system that we'll look at later. So for each of these four systems, we're going to apply a set of three different inputs. We're going to apply an input that changes from 0 to 1 at time 20. We're going to apply an input that is a relatively low frequency cosine, that's frequency pi over 8, and we'll apply another input that has a relatively high frequency cosine, where that's 7 pi over 8. So starting with the system that does the six-point averaging, we can see that as this discontinuity of x of n at time 20 begins to enter the system, that the amplitude grows, because I'm just taking the average of the past values, and eventually it averages out to 1. And when I apply a relatively low frequency cosine, I have a gain close to 1 for this particular system. There's some reduction in gain because this averaging and the cosine is changing over the span of six points, and that causes the average to drop the values down a little bit. But if I look at the high frequency cosine, notice the change in the scale here. Now here, the maximum and minimum values in the graph are between minus 0.2 and 0.2. So we can see that this input started out at unit amplitude, and it's been attenuated significantly. If we compare this to the system that does a six-point difference, we see that as we would expect, when I put this constant input in, I get some outputs that are not zero in the transition region. But once the value of 1 fills up all these past samples, when n is greater than or equal to 25, then I'm going to get exactly zero, because I'm 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1. And in this case, the low frequency cosine, because we're taking this difference, is going to be attenuated more. And we see that, that it was started out at an amplitude of 1. And here it's now between minus 0.2 and plus 0.2 for the axis limits. Whereas the high frequency cosine, because it's changing sign, and of course 
This doesn't really look like much of a cosine, but that's because this cosine is frequency is so high that it's oscillating in between values here. And when we sample it, it doesn't really look like a cosine function. But in this case, because the cosine is changing sine and this is changing sine, those effects are amplified by the system and we see the gain stays close to one for the high frequency cosine. So the two recursive systems now, we'll look at those. And if I have the system that's the low pass recursive system, where the output at the present time is 0.95 times the previous output, plus 0.05 times the input, you can see that the step response of this system, it slowly builds up to one. And eventually we're in the regime where this constant gets passed with unit gain by the system. That's why we say it's a low pass system. And if I look at the gain to a low frequency cosine, you see that it's only 0.2, which is kind of what we had in the differencing system, which we said passed high frequencies. But comparing that to the gain to the high frequency cosine, we see that the high frequency cosine is attenuated quite a bit more by a factor of at least four relative to the low frequency cosine. In contrast, the high pass system when we put this constant into it, eventually it settles down to a value which is on the order of 0 0.025. So it's got quite a bit of attenuation of that constant. And you see that also with the low frequency cosine in that it is attenuated pretty significantly by this particular system, whereas the high frequency cosine is passed with greater gain, it still receives a significant amount of attenuation by a factor of approximately six, but the scenario compared to the low pass recursive system is exactly reversed. 